Hey, Shriver here. Gonna do a little demo on a lab we call the Cell Membrane Bubble Lab. We use bubbles, soap bubbles. Hold on. To model the cell membrane because soap bubbles act a lot like a cell membrane does, and we'll show you why right now. Follow along with me, take notes with me. So first thing we need to look at is how is a cell membrane built that is similar to the way in which a soap bubble membrane is built. So the molecules are similar. So we'll draw a little box here and we'll put in here the phospholipid bilayer. Now, you probably remember um, the, your foam model activities that we did over the phospholipid. The phospholipids have two parts. It has a phosphate head that is attracted to water. It's hydrophilic, and you have the, the lipid tail that is hydrophobic or repelled by water. So if we draw just a little segment of a little simple model, a little simple sketch of the cell membrane, it might look something like this. We've got our phosphate heads. Remember, it's a, it's a bilayer. It's going to be two members, two layers that make up the membrane. So if you think of this as, as a cell all the way out here, and we're just looking at one little piece of it, okay? Um, of course, you should know that the cell inside the cell is, is a watery environment. So there's water in here. And the cells live in a watery environment, so there's water out here too. And we know that these heads that I drew are attracted to water, and the tails that I haven't drawn yet are repelled by water. So think about which way the tails are going to, to face. They're going to face, face in towards each other and away from the watery environment. So we can just kind of put these little lipid tails, remember two per molecule. You can just kind of draw those in, doesn't have to be anything fancy. And this is what we already understand about the phospholipid bilayer. Zoom in for you here. Yeah, that was nice. All right, so I'm going to draw another box. I'm going to draw it over here. And then here we'll draw a soap bubble membrane. Draw a soap membrane over there. So a soap molecule is similar to the phospholipid in that it has a head and one tail instead of two. But the head is hydrophilic just like the head of our phospholipids, and the tail is hydrophobic. This is how soap works. The tail is actually attracted to fats, proteins, so it'll grab those, and these heads will attach to water, and this will form kind of like a surrounding around, you know, stuff on your dishes or in your dirty clothes or whatever, and, and it'll kind of surround those little dirt and dry molecules, and this will attract the water would be grab, grabbing hold of the water that goes down the drain. So it'll just flush everything right down the drain. That's how soap works. So if we draw a soap bubble, kind of like we drew our um, cell membrane bubble, again, we're going to have some heads that are, remember, are hydrophilic or attracted to water. I'm going to draw these a little closer to each other than I do other. Okay. So that's my membrane. Similar to the cell. In this case, we don't have water inside the uh, soap bubble. A soap bubble has, has trapped air inside of it. Hmm, the right air in orange, I guess. Air is in here. And air is outside of the soap bubble. And so what the soap bubble does, because these heads are attracted to water, they're hydrophilic, what a soap, soap molecules do is they create a really thin film of water in between there. So our water, instead of being inside the cell and outside of the cell, is actually trapped in between the soap molecules. So our soap membrane might look something like that. Make sure you get these sketches in your notes, just right alongside the other phospholipid stuff that we did. 
Okay, so we're going to examine um, six different properties of a cell membrane that a soap bubble can model just like uh, that a soap bubble, uh, bubble model uh, and acts just like a cell membrane does in these six different ways. Okay, so I'm going to erase this. All right, so the first concept or property of a cell membrane that a soap bubble can demonstrate for us is that um, the cell membrane is really fluid and elastic. So this is cell concept one is what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call them, I'm going to, I'm going to call them cell concepts, of properties of a cell membrane. So cell concept one. This one states that membranes... are fluid and flexible. Okay? Fluid and flexible. So I was kind of trying to demonstrate that earlier with this little little uh, bubble frame. I've got this soapy solution here and I've got a bubble frame. If you look at it, hopefully the light catches it. You can really see now, if I kind of tilt it different ways, or just you can see the swirly, pretty swirly lights. You can kind of see how the molecules just move around in there. If I take, it popped. If I take this and just kind of play with it with gravity, you can see how it bounces up and down. It's very fluid and flexible. Think about when we watched that video of bubble of um, blood cells, and they were flowing. And you can see that as they ran into each other, they got in tight spots, they can change shapes, they can bend and move in order to fit their environment. So this is very much the same way that an actual cell membrane can, um, can, can act, can behave. Think about in places of your body that move a lot, like your lips, in tight spots like your elbow in here, right here. See these cells right here in the crook of my elbow would be really squished, where these back here would be stout. And things in your neck where this moves a lot, things of high movement in your body. Um, and those cells have to be able to change shape. They have to be able to be pliable. Okay, so now what I want you to do in your journal, you should write, you should have written this down. Concept one, membranes are fluid and flexible, and I demonstrated that with the bubbles. So what I want you to do is put this in your own words now. Write down my words, but also rewrite it in your own words. This makes you think. You have got to take it and translate it into your own words that you understand, and this builds new neural connections in your brain so you can understand this stuff and you can remember it. So write that in your own words. And describe how I used bubbles to model that particular property concept with the same vocab, that concept. Okay, so write this in your own words and then describe how I use this. So you can just write about how I took this and you could see the, you could see the pretty swirly, you can see it swirling not really about the lights, but the lights do show you that the molecules are swirly. It's got a cool oily look. Let's try to get some light and cool. I don't know if I'm catching it in the camera or not. It's swirling, trust me. And then I can get it bouncing. I can twist this frame, move it around, and the membrane goes right along with it to fit its environment. Okay, so right about that. All right, now let's look at cell concept number two, second property. I'll just erase this. I'll erase this. So the second cell concept states that membranes can self-repair.
if membrane, cell membranes get damaged to their molecular structure because the phospholipids are attracted to each other and the heads are attracted to water and the tails are attracted or repelled by water and attracted to each other, they naturally orient themselves right back to where they, they, they were in their original. If it's a, you know, of course you can, you can destroy a cell, but to some degree, if it's just minor damage, the cells can repair themselves. So here you see my bubble frame. I've got a bubble in there, and if I get my finger, or even my whole hand, nice and wet with soap, I can put my whole hand through this bubble. See that? Oh, popped. All models are wrong. Some are useful. I can put my finger in there, move it around, pull it back out. The membrane doesn't pop. I hope you can see that in the camera. See that? I can get my whole hand in there. It's easier done with partners. Here, would you hold this for me? Popped. Ah. Let's just try one finger for demo purposes here. Oh my gosh, embarrassing. Imagine how this went with 20 students in here trying to do this. It's not perfect, but it is cool nonetheless. There we go. Ta-da! So membranes can self-repair. Now, there are cool videos that I like to show in class. I'll try to link it into this video, but I don't know. How, I'm not very techy. Uh, in vitro fertilization. So we can take an egg out of a healthy female, and we can take sperm from a healthy male, and we can inject that sperm right into the egg, outside of the body, right? And then they incubate it, and if it works out, they'll implant that into the female, you know, if a couple's having troubles conceiving a child. And there are cool videos of this called an Ipsy. And um, normally, I'll, I'll try to post a link to it, but you can see that a needle pokes through the cell membrane, injects a sperm, and then the needle comes back out of the cell, the egg, and, and uh, the, the membrane just closes back up. It's not damaged. It's perfectly fine. So again, now that I've demonstrated that cell concept, whoops, number two... Membranes can self-repair. I'd like for you to take that in your paper, write, of course, this, but also write that in your own words. And then write about how I used the cell membrane or the bubbles to demonstrate that particular property of the cell membrane. Okay. All right, now number three. This one's pretty cool, but kind of tricky. I forgot a string. Hold on. And I'm back. Sorry about that. I'll take a piece of thread, a piece of thread, and I'm just going to tie a loop in it here. A small loop. Get rid of the extra. And now I've got a little loop of string. Okay. All right. So cell concept three states. Got to do a vocab here. That eukaryotic. Remember that word from biology class. Eukaryotic cells have the membrane bound organelles. Now that I've written that, I realize I don't actually need my string yet, but I'll need it in just a minute. Okay, so I'm going to put the string down. We don't need that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put the camera down here on my bubbles. And I'm gonna get a straw. And I can take this and I can blow a bubble. Make a nice good sized bubble here. Now you can imagine that this bubble might be a cell. It's a cell living there. But we have organelles in there, remember, like a nucleus or the 
in a plasmic reticulum or the mitochondrion. They're all wrapped in membranes that are similar, made the same stuff as the cell membrane here. So what I can do is, to mimic that, I can just put this straw, and as long as I, I have soap up the straw, it won't pop, kind of similar to how um, the cell membrane can uh, self-repair. So let's see if I can create a eukaryotic cell with membrane-bound organelles inside it. So there you go. Let's see if I can get the camera angle so there's not as much glare. Here we see a cell, or a bubble, and inside it I've got two other little bubbles. So that might be a nucleus. Whoop, came out. Let me try again. operate. Because they're made of the same material, the cell, the, the membranes can fuse and the little bubbles can just easily leave. In a real cell, they have what's called a cytoskeleton that keeps all that stuff from, from leaving the cell. Okay, trying again. Got a big cell. Let's try to put some organelles in it. Oh, and I don't have much glare either. That's good. So that's good to be good. So you can see we've got little organelles in there. You might think of them as a nucleus or um, endoplasticulum or mitochondria or whatever, ribosomes. Plus, it's tons of fun to play with. Okay, so again, that's particular cell concept stated that eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles. This is different from prokaryotes, or prokaryotic cells, which I don't need for you to know about, but just I'm going to mention it because it might help trigger some of those memories from basic bio class and pull those back out of your deleted files. So eukaryotic cells are what we are. That's what plants are and, and uh, fungus and protozoans. But bacteria are not. They are prokaryotic. So that means that they don't have any membrane-bound organelles. The DNA just floats around in their cytoplasm. Same thing with a virus. A virus is really just a bundle of DNA with a protein coat around it. It's a very simple thing. I about called it an organism, but it's still if it's actually an organism. But anyway, back to us. We're eukaryotes. We've got nuclei. We have mitochondria. We have these membrane-bound organelles. So in your own words, eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles. In your words. And describe how I use the bubbles to try to demonstrate that. I'm going to erase it now. Okay. So, what are we on for? Yeah. Now I think I need my string. This one's super cool. Hopefully I can do it by myself. Really need a partner for this one. Okay, so cell concept four. This is about special proteins, membrane proteins. Membrane proteins. That's a P. Have special functions. Perform. I like that better. <laughs> Ran out of room. They perform special functions. Okay, so we're back to when we were watching uh, the video about red blood cells, and you could see them moving, and when they ran into each other, they bent and squished and got out of shape. Um, as they kind of ran into things, they would change their shape in order to fit their environment. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm off track. That was the first one, wasn't it? We already talked about that. Remember back to when we watched the video, and we saw if they were in an isotonic solution, the red blood cells, they, they looked normal and healthy and happy. But if we put them in a hypertonic solution, the water got drawn out of them. They crenated or shriveled up, changed their shape, meaning the water left the cell in order for that to happen. And um, when we put them in hypotonic solution, the water went into the cell, and then the cells blew up and, and uh, lysed or, or exploded. So we knew that water was moving in and out of the cell, but we also know that because of the phospholipid bilayer and those tails, water wouldn't be able to get through. So we looked at transport proteins, proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane to help materials move in and out. 
of the cell. So that's what I'm going to try to do with this piece of string. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the camera back down here to my soap. Okay. Now I need to get the string wet with the soap. I need to make a loop. Got a bit of a loop. Hopefully it didn't take too much soap off of it. And I need to pick up my bubble membrane. Watch this. This is going to open up another portal to another dimension. It's going to be cool. Ready? So here we are. I put the string on there. Oop, that didn't work. Put the string... First, you don't succeed. Try, try again. Okay, so we make a bubble membrane. We'll put this on there. Okay, great success. Now, I pop that right in the middle. Now, look at that. See that? See that? See how that's a perfect little circle there? Look at that. It moves around the cell just like a transport protein would in a real cell. That was a model of a transport protein. Now, if you don't think that's cool, maybe I'm not videoing right. <laughs> That's really cool. Let's do it again just to make sure. Okay, so I got my bubble or my, my cell membrane. I've got my transport protein. Put the protein on the bubble or on the, pro the cell membrane. Pop them. And see what that does is it makes a perfect circle there. See that? That's it. You can really see the swirlies there now. Back to concept one. That's just neat. I just love that. It'd be cooler if it would stay for a minute. Last one. So now anything can travel through that, right? And it's not going to even touch the cell membrane. It's just right. It's just right through there, and they they can move around inside the cell. They're kind of wherever they need to be. You can really see the swirlies. That's just cool. I hope I hope, I hope that shows up well. I hope you think that's cool. Okay, I think it's cool. And I hope it helps you understand things. So that was like a membrane protein that allows materials to move into and out of the cell. So put that in your own words and then describe how I used that piece of string and the bubbles in order to mimic that particular concept or that particular property. Sorry, my wife's texting me. I got to pick up my daughter today after volleyball practice. All right, I'm going to erase. Okay, number five. Cell concept five is kind of hard for me to do. This is about gap junctions. I think we're going to have a really hard time capturing this on camera. We'll see what we can do. If not, I recorded some students that did it, and I'll try to embed their videos in this. Okay, so this one is called gap junctions. There are many different kinds of gap junctions that cells use. Um, we're not going to get into all the different kinds, but what gap junctions do is they allow cells to transport materials from one cell to another. So all your cells, like you're in your skin, they're all, they all live next to each other, and they need to transport materials back and forth or information back and forth. And they use these structures <coughs> called gap junctions in order to do that. It's kind of like a, a doorway that two neighbor cells might share so they can lend each other some sugar or whatever. Okay, So gap junctions uh, aid in transport between animal cells. Alrighty, gap junction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to create a gap junction in my bubble here. It's a little bit tricky, and it might be even trickier to get it on camera. We'll see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to put, the, put this back down here on the soap. I'm going to make a cell. All right, there's my cell. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try to blow into this cell and move my straw away from it while I'm blowing it. And if I do it right, there will be a connection from the end of my straw to the bubble, kind of like a little tunnel. Uh, and I can still share information or materials, in this case air, 
with the, uh, the bubble. Of course, in real life, they'd be sharing things like sugar or waste products or, or whatever. So let's see how this goes. No dice. I can do this, I promise. It was there for just a moment. Man, I tell you, some kids in the earlier classes, they were getting them like three, four inches long. I don't even know if this is on camera. Did you see that? Do you see it? Is it on camera? It's a gap junction. It's like a tunnel from my straw to the cell, and we can share information or material back and forth. Hard to do. Did you see that? There was a stream. I picked the bubble out of there. The bubble was stuck to the end of my my straw, and it wasn't touching the tray anymore. But then it left my tray, my bubble, my straw, and it had a gap junction there, or gap junction model anyway. There's a little one. Did you see that? I'm just not sure if you're seeing it or not. If not, we'll go over it later. I'll show you. If that didn't work, if it didn't show up on the video, I can't tell. Um, I've got a good video I'll show you, or I'll try to link the video in here of a student doing it. Did a great job. Okay, now the last one. Oh, just kidding. Cell concept five. Gap junctions aid in transmitting cells. It's a way for them to share materials. Put that in your own words. This is how I tried to use that uh, to show you a gap junction model. Now I get to erase. Okay, number six. This is about reproduction. It's about making more cells, especially bacteria. Many bacteria, they reproduce through a process called binary fission. So us, being mammals, in animals, we reproduce sexually. It takes uh, both an egg and a sperm in order to reproduce. But not all organisms have to do that. Bacteria and some other things, they can clone themselves or go through a process called binary fission, where they just simply make copies of each other, of themselves. Okay? It's an identical clone. So I can mimic that by taking a little piece of my string again. A longer piece this time. Okay? So I've got some string here. I'm just going to try to mimic binary fission. So I'm going to blow a bubble. I'll put this camera down here. I'm going to blow a bubble. Make it a nice size. Ooh, did you see I had a gap junction there? I'll make sure the bubble's in the screen. Wrong way. Then if I take my string and go through the bubble underneath, pull it up, look, now I've got two bubbles. Then go this way. I killed it. Let me get this out of the way. This is a really cool demonstration that shows you uh, how a bacterial population can grow so fast. Watch this. From one, and it goes through fission. Now we have two, and they go through fission. They have four, then they go through fission. You see, if I just keep doing that, I end up with lots and lots of cells in a really short amount of time, or lots and lots of bubbles. Think about this as a zygote, too, an egg that gets fertilized by a sperm. It's just a ball of dividing cells. It's kind of like this. It's just like it would be more of a cluster, a bunch of a ball of, of these cells, but kind of the same process. I mean, just splitting, just copying, 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 copying. You can see quickly how a bacterial population could, uh, could grow quite quickly. So you see I had one cell, and now I have some lots of cells. That's it. That is cell concept six. Bubbly, bubbly. Which says that many bacteria reproduce through binary fission.
Put that in your own words. Describe how I used bubbles to model the cell concept. Okay? Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned something. Tomorrow back in class, we'll be going over this uh, test review, testing procedures in this class. Okay? You got it. You got this. Okay. Keep your notes binder, and I'll check your binders on test day. Bye.